Hello YouTube. In this video we're going to return to the scientific realism debate and I'm going to present the bad lot problem or uh, it's sometimes called the argument from under consideration. So I'm assuming you're familiar with scientific realism. I have a whole series on it if not. Uh, but scientific realists claim that our best theories provide approximately true descriptions of reality. Anti-realists deny this. So uh, we've seen in previous videos that for most realists, inference to the best explanation justifies belief in our best theories. We are justified in believing the truth of whatever theory provides the best explanation for the evidence. And this occurs on two levels. So in the first place, scientists apply inference to the best explanation when choosing which theories to adopt the best explanation for the cosmic microwave background radiation, galactic redshift, abundance of elements, and so on, is the Big Bang model. Um, so you know, we, we, have all of, you know, we have all of this data, we have all of these other beliefs, and the best explanation for all of these phenomena is the Big Bang model. And on this basis, scientists accept, at least provisionally, uh, the, the Big Bang model. <clears throat> then, on, on a sort of higher level, Philosophers will apply inference to the best explanation to defend scientific realism directly uh, with the claim that the approximate truth of our best theories is the best explanation for their success. And this is the, uh, the no miracles argument that we have discussed in, in some of the earlier videos. Um, so you know, again, we, we have this puzzling phenomenon. We have the striking uh, predictive and technological successes of science. And the best explanation for this phenomenon is that science gets things right. It gets at the truth. Truth explains success. And it's not just that truth explains success, but the truth of our best theories is the best explanation for their success. So <clears throat> we can infer that our best theories are at least approximately true. OK, well, the basic idea of uh, inference to the best explanation is pretty straightforward. We have some set of data, we generate some potential explanations, and then we try to determine which of these scores highest with respect to what are sometimes called explanatory virtues. So these are things like empirical adequacy, consistency, simplicity, explanatory scope, testability, unification of diverse phenomena, fruitfulness for further research, and so on. Different philosophers will have a different account of what exactly the explanatory virtues are. Um, but, you know, like th these ones, again, you know, th these are usually going to turn up in most lists, right? So we, we, we want theories that um, make the right predictions, that are fairly simple, etc. Um, and then, of course, having determined which theory scores the best on these virtues, we infer that this theory is true. So anyway, we have, you know, so, so we have E, right, some, some set of data, and then we say, you know, of various theories, we consider various theories and we figure out which provides the best explanation, and then we infer to that theory. Now, of course, that theory is not guaranteed to be true, but we can say that it's, you know, it's, it's probable or that it's reasonable to believe given that it is the best explanation. Now, one of the central challenges to inference to the best explanation is the bad lot objection. Um, so basically, the idea is inference to the best explanation is only going to be a reliable guide to the truth if we can be sure that the true theory is among the theories that we have considered. Um, so, you know, so, so we, we consider various theories, we have this phenomenon, we consider various theories and we infer to the best one, but that's only going to be a reliable guide to the truth if we've got some reason to think that, the, that those theories that we have considered were among, you know, that, that, that we have considered the true one. Um, so <clears throat> often there is no reason to believe this, or so the, the claim will be. As Baz van Frassen puts it, and I quote, we can watch no contest of the theories we have so painfully struggled to formulate with those no one has proposed. So our selection may well be the best of a bad lot. And a key thought here is that theory evaluation is often comparative. Um, the most that we can say is that one theory is superior to the competitor theories that we have, that we have considered.
right? Like that's that's what we can say. We can say, well, you know, we've considered a whole bunch of theories and this is the best one so far, but this doesn't allow us to take the further step of declaring that this theory is true. Um, inference to the best of a bad lot, a lot of theories that does not include the true theory, that doesn't justify belief. Well, I mean, I think the argument here is fairly straightforward, um, but, you know, uh, here's a way of formalising it. This comes from Ruth Weintraub in the article Skepticism about Inference, the Best Explanation. She puts it this way, <clears throat> the best and good enough explanation of all possible explanations of a phenomenon is true. Uh, we have no reason for thinking that a true theory is included among the explanations we have considered. So we have no reason for thinking that our best explanation is likely to be true. Realism then, from this point of view, assumes a kind of epistemic privilege. Um, so the, the realist is assuming that in general, a true explanation is probably included among the theories we consider. So that so scientists are epistemically privileged in the sense of they, they are reliable at proposing theories that tend to be true. They're reliable at generating true theories which can then be considered. So like from the space of all possible theories, um, scientists tend to pick out the true ones um, <clears throat> to then like evaluate. And the, the bad law objection um, rejects this assumption, right? So if this is right, then, you know, we can we can accept the premises of an inference to the best explanation. So just to go back, we can we can accept I1 and I2, right? And And yet the conclusion the theory uh, is that's not likely that's not even likely to be true right if our theories m might have been selected from a bad lot then the anti-realist will say we just have no reason to believe the conclusion of an inference to the best explanation now in fact um, anti-realists can take two lines here so um, the, the sort of I guess weaker argument and this is how I framed it here um, is to say that realists have just failed to establish this epistemic privilege there is no reason for thinking that true theories tend to be considered. A stronger argument kind of goes on the attack and would say, well, there's good reason to think that that when evaluating theories, the true theory will not be included. There's good reason to think that scientists are not privileged in this respect. And so this gives us a, a, a perhaps a stronger bad law objection, which would say, you know, the best explanation of all possible explanations of a phenomenon is true. Um, premise two, there is good reason to think that a true theory is not included among the explanations we have considered. So there is good reason to think that our best explanation is not likely to be true. So that's a more sort of stronger, um, <clears throat> stronger scepticism there. One initial reason uh, to take this stronger argument seriously is, well, uh, when we look at the, the history of science, it tends to be the case that scientists conceive of only a small number of theories. I mean, actually, not just, I mean, you don't just have to look at the history of science, you can look at modern science as well. But like, um, just in general, when we look at uh, how people develop scientific theories, right, um, scientists tend to conceive of a relatively small number. It's, it's actually hard to come up with even one theory that adequately accommodates the phenomena. It often takes decades of work to shape a theory up so that it makes the right predictions, uh, let alone uh, exhibits other explanatory virtues. And yet, um, the, the sort of the space of logically possible theories is unfathomably large. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's, well, it's everything that's logically possible, right? So we might think there are going to be far more theories that are never even thought of than theories that we actually put to the test, than theories that are considered in our lot of explanations. Um, so that maybe um, is, is one way we might try to um, forward this, uh, this stronger argument. Um, now, notice that the bad lot objection concedes that if the true theory were considered, it probably would be chosen. So um, the, the, the anti-realist who makes the bad lot objection is granting this much to the realist. The anti-realist is granting that, yeah, IBE, inference to the best explanation, is a useful tool for selecting the true theory, provided the true theory is on the table in the first place. Now, 
the anti-realists can raise challenges to this, right? Like this is controversial. So, you know, we can ask, for instance, well, what are the explanatory virtues? And once we've specified the explanatory virtues, can we show that truth is connected in the right way to explanatoriness? Um, there are reasons for supposing that good explanations sometimes deviate from the truth. Uh, consider, for instance, the use of idealizations in science, um, where, you know, if I'm modeling a star, I might model it as being composed of uh, an ideal gas. Of course, we know that there really are no ideal gases. So we're sort of using a falsehood in the model there. Um, <clears throat> or consider uh, the trade-off between generality, accuracy, and precision. Um, if you want models that apply to, more generally that apply to lots of different phenomena, then you're going to have to sacrifice uh, accurate and precise accounts of particular phenomena. Again, I've, I've covered all of this in, in previous videos, but the point is, is um, you know, we're putting this aside, right? We're putting all of these points aside for the purposes of the bad lot objection. So we're just going to assume that, yeah, the, the true theory uh, would score the best on the explanatory virtues, and that scientists reliably recognize this. Um, the, the problem that is being, being pushed here is there's just no reason for supposing that a true theory is among those that have been considered. There's no reason for supposing that that has been put on the table in the first place. So that, that is the challenge. Uh, so what might realists say in response to this? Well, one response uh, concerns the privilege assumption. Um, so this is, I think, quite a, a kind of natural response to the bad law objection, and it's to say, look, <clears throat> scientists clearly are epistemically privileged with respect to selecting true theories, or at least we have, uh, yeah, we have good reason to think that they are. After all, uh, scientists have special training, which gives them expertise in investigating particular domains. You know, surely a person who has spent their whole life uh, studying a particular domain will be more likely to come up with true theories with respect to that domain than a person who has no such training. Um, like, you know, scientists have, like, they spent years and years and years working, right, in specific fields, right, in specific areas, so they're going to be, they're going to be much better than most people at coming up with true theories there. Um, moreover, scientists use sophisticated instruments, they use special methods of data analysis which have been well tested across lots of different domains. Think about the use of reliable instruments like you know atomic force microscopes, x-ray telescopes, uh, we have tools like polymerase chain reaction, um, we've developed methods like you know double blind studies, randomized control trials, uh, experimental replication, regression analysis, analysis of variance, Bayesian inference. I mean, you can go on and on and on, right? I mean, we have this whole battery of methods for designing experiments, analyzing data, and we've got a good idea of the scope and limits of these methods. You know, it's not like these are just things that, it's not like looking into a crystal ball, right? I mean, we've actually tested all this stuff and we, we know what it can do and what it can't do. Moreover, scientists learn from the mistakes of their predecessors. Uh, there are lots of false theories of the past that have now been rejected. There are lots of uh, methods of investigation or standards of theory evaluation that were seen to be problematic and have now been corrected. And as an institution, science has methods like peer review, um, which correct for personal biases by holding ideas subject to a variety of critical perspectives. So in a variety of ways, scientists exhibit remarkable epistemic privilege. Well, um, all of this is of course true, but it's uh, important to bear in mind what the anti-realist has in mind when they say like epistemic privilege. The, the question is, <coughs> the question is <clears throat> uh, whether uh, when generating theories, scientists tend to produce theories that are true. Now, um, we can accept for instance that scientists are more likely to generate true theories than a layperson is, right? So if somebody has been, you know, yeah, like studying chemistry their whole life, then they're, they're more likely to come up with a true theory in that domain than a layperson. But uh, they might still be relatively unlikely to do that, you know, like, it, yeah, so it could be like a layperson has got like, you know, 0.01% chance and the scientist has only a 1% chance or something like that, right? Um, so, you know, yeah, much more likely, but still not likely. Um, so 
in general, the, the problem is, is that the sort of tools that we outlined here and the sort of methods and so on, um, that, those tools make scientists excellent at, um, at sort of comparative evaluation of theories uh, uh, and, and like figuring out whether one theory is superior to another and also figuring out uh, the degree to which a theory exhibits the explanatory virtues. So given, you know, two or more theories, scientists are going to reliably select the one that makes the right predictions that is simple, that can unify diverse phenomena, and so on. I mean, and that's uncontroversial, right? Like, the anti-realist accepts all of that stuff. But then the worry is, well, most of these tools are not going to be much use in uh, generating true theories in the first place. Instruments produce data that can be used to test existing theories or, you know, that present surprising phenomena that new theories must explain. Um, but, you know, this is just a matter of kind of making of like generating new observations and of course um, the anti-realist uh, at least you know most anti-realists accept like yeah science is very good uh, scientific theory is very good at uh, accommodating uh, observations similarly methods of experimental design well they're not exactly tools for theory generation but again for generating data in a reliable way for testing existing theories uh, these sorts of tools put us in a very good position for testing the theories that have been proposed but it's not obvious how it makes us particularly likely to propose true theories in the first place. Um, I mean, that, 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 that process of, of like proposing true theories or like where do theories come from? I mean, in, you know, theories can kind of come from anywhere. Sometimes you get scientists who say like uh, that a, a theory came to them in a dream. Um, I think it was the uh, discovery of the structure of the benzene molecule um, came to some, it's, uh, I'm not even going to try to pronounce the guy's name. It's, it begins with a K. Um, but I think it... Uh, <laughs> Uh, he had a dream about a snake eating its own tail or something and then you know that that prompted him to think of this idea um, <clears throat> So again, you know, the, so like once you have an idea once you have an idea on the table You can use all of these wonderful tools uh, To test it and you can be very reliable at that and you and you can kind of select Powerful theories as a result of that, but it's not obvious that it makes us likely to propose true theories in the first place or so the anti-realist might say Okay, a second response to the bad lot problem is that it assumes a mistaken characterization of how inference to the best explanation actually works. So I, I said that the structure of inference to the best explanation is, you know, we have, we have like E, some set of evidence, and then, you know, we come up with various theories and we see which provides the best explanation and then we infer to that theory. But we can just say, well, this is missing a crucial premise. So, you know, yep, this argument, this argument here, that's unconvincing. The premises there can be true, yet the conclusion not even probably true, right? Like, in fact, the conclusion might probably be false, right? So it's, it's not a strong argument. It's not even inductively strong. But we need, it, we need only add a further premise. We need only add the premise that T1 is a good explanation, right? That the theory is not just the best explanation. It is a, it is a good one. It's a good explanation, whereby good explanation what we mean is an explanation that scores well enough on the relevant explanatory virtues now with this we we have an argument that the realist may say gives us a good reason to believe the conclusion inference to the best explanation requires not just that we find the best explanation from a set of potential explanations but also that this explanation be good enough now it may be that we have uh, no explanation that exhibits the relevant virtues, but in that case, we just wouldn't apply inference the best explanation. And actually, there are a whole host of currently unsolved problems in science. Uh, for example, what is the cause of fast radio bursts? What is the origin of life? What is the biological function of sleep? In these cases, there are plenty of potential explanations, right? Like we've put lots of theories on the table, but none of them are considered adequate. So for now, the scientific community sus suspends judgment, right? None of, none of these are accepted. And notice an important point here, because what this suggests, right? The fact that we have various explanations on the table, but we're suspending judgment on all of them, that suggests that we do, in fact, uh, have the ability to determine whether or not an explanation is good enough. And we do, in fact, have a sense of when an explanation is probably true. Um, 
because like we we're looking at like when we look at say well what's the cause of yeah what what's the cause of like fast radio bursts or what's the origin of life well we see people have pre presented a whole bunch of explanations but you know like we can we can look at them and say ah yeah i mean but none of them like they all seem to have problems none of them really seem to be getting it right so we do have a sense of um of like truth um and of course this isn't just the case for scientists right scientists actually aren't uniquely privileged in this respect most of us will use inference to the best explanation in everyday contexts and we are similarly able to judge the intrinsic worth of explanations let's say for instance that i find that my hats keep going missing i i, I have lots of hats in my house and they just keep going missing i can consider various explanations for this so ghosts burglary memory problems and I can then see, okay, none of these are adequate explanations, right? Like postulating ghosts, well, that would that would completely transform my worldview. I'd have to suppose that there are entities completely unlike anything I accept. Um, you know, that that seems like uh, very, you know, there's very flimsy evidence on which to, you know, have a massive conceptual revolution in my worldview. Um, and then burglary, well, that, you know, that doesn't really make sense because why would somebody come into my house every day, you know, why would they take the risk just to steal hats over and over again? Uh, memory problems, well, that's the kind of thing that would manifest in other contexts, whereas maybe the only problem I have is that my hats keep going missing. And then, But then I, I might, you know, come upon an explanation that's like, it's not just it's not just the best, right? Because of those three explanations, maybe I would say, okay, memory problems are the best explanation, but eh, that still doesn't really seem right. But then I come upon an explanation that's not just the best, it's good enough. So I might think, ah, my brother is playing some sort of elaborate prank on me. Maybe this is in retaliation for some prank I played on him in the past. So now I have, I think, oh, right, that's not just the best explanation. This is, this is a good enough explanation. Like it fits, it doesn't just, you know, it fits my observations and it also exhibits the relevant explanatory virtues. And then in science, we just kind of extend and refine this ability, the ability that all of us have um, to, you know, not just sort of judge the comparative value of an explanation, but also judge its intrinsic goodness. Um, so that's that's another point. What what might the anti-realist say here? Well, um, so we, the anti-realist might point out, well, look, <clears throat> you know, yes, we, we do make these judgments of like the intrinsic worth of explanations, but there have been plenty of cases where scientists have accepted explanations, but those explanations have turned out to be mistaken, right? There are plenty of theories that exhibit all the relevant explanatory virtues, but that are still false. Um, and so, of course, at this point, we're kind of falling back on other anti-realist arguments, I mean, you know, the appeal to the history of science that we saw in the pessimistic induction, like, okay, we can cite theories that were uh, successful in the past, but that have since been displaced. Um, though I should note that, I guess the point here is not so much as in the pessimistic induction that, like, we should expect currently accepted theories to be rejected in the future. Rather, the point is that, so it's like, yes, we do have this kind of internal sense of when an explanation is good enough. But there's reason to think that this sense doesn't kind of, like that doesn't necessarily reliably track the truth. Um, like there are good theories, there are good theories that may also be part of the bad lot um, because they can be, so there are theories that are good in the sense of exhibiting the relevant explanatory virtues, but part of the bad lot because none of them are true, right? So that's what it is. You know, so we, we have this like, so just because you know, you've pre you're presented with a lot of theories and one of those theories uh, strikes you as good enough, right? It's like, it's not just that it explains the phenomena, but that it exhibits all the relevant explanatory virtues. Just because you have that, um, that, that doesn't show that the true theory has been considered. Uh, so the anti-realist might say. Um, but again, you know, I, I do think that this point... <coughs> Yeah, at this point we maybe are um, like falling back on some of the more uh, kind of traditional anti-realist arguments. So uh, we might, yeah, I, we, you know, we might we might wonder whether this uh, bad lot problem really is separate from uh, other anti-realist arguments that we've seen. <coughs> <coughs> right, let's move on. A couple other responses to the bad lot problem come from Peter Lipton. Okay, so the third response is that um, the anti-realist 
The anti-realist grants that scientists are reliable with respect to comparative evaluation. Uh, if scientists take theory T1 to be a better explanation than T2, then we can say T1 is more probable than T2. But I mean, of course, that doesn't mean that like we have reason to think that T1 is true. Um, it's just T1 is better than T2. So that, that's what the anti-realist grants. So Lipton says the anti-realist is, is granting that for the sake of argument. <clears throat> The key claim of the bad lot objection is that there's no reason to suppose that the true theory has been considered, but comparative evaluations are fine. The trouble, according to Lipton, is this kind of comparative evaluation collapses into absolute assessment. If we can make the comparative claim that one theory is more probable than another, then we will be able to identify hypotheses that we can say are probable, period, right, that are more likely than not to be true. And <coughs> and the, the, the kind of crux of Lipton's argument here is that every pair of contraries entails a pair of contradictories. So two theories are contraries, uh, just in case if we know that one theory is true, we know that the other one is false. Uh, if two theories are contraries, the truth of one entails the falsehood of the other. However, if we know that one is false, we don't necessarily know that the other is two. true, because tr two theories might be contraries, but both can be false. So you know, the falsehood of one doesn't entail the truth of the other. And indeed, this is the, the standard situation in science. We are often comparing theories that might both turn out to be false. Uh, consider two models of the universe, the Big Bang model and the steady state model. According to the steady state model, the universe is expanding, but the density of matter in the universe remains unchanged over time because of the continuous creation of new matter. Now, if I know that the Big Bang model is true, I know that the steady state model is false, and vice versa. But what if new evidence turns up that leads us to think that the Big Bang, Big Bang, model, the Big Bang model is false? Well, that wouldn't establish that the steady state model is true. Perhaps some entirely different model is required. Perhaps the universe isn't expanding at all, right? I mean, that would refute both models. So those are contraries. Now with contradictories, by contrast, these are such that if I know that one is false, then I know the other is true. So consider the claims, um, the universe is eternal, and it is not the case that the universe is eternal. The truth of one entails the falsity of the other, and the falsity of one entails the truth of the other. Um, that, that's how contradictories work. Um, okay, so with this in mind, uh, Lipton's argument is, and I quote, he says, suppose we wish to rank the contradictories T1 and not T1. If we find a contrary to T1, say T2, that is ranked ahead of T1, then not T1 is ranked ahead of T1, since T2 entails not T1. Alternatively, if we find a contrary of not T1, say T3, that is ranked ahead of not T1, then T1 is ranked ahead of not T1, since T3 entails T1. Okay, what's going on here? Well, yeah, okay, so, so consider T1 and its contradictory not T1. Now, we find a contrary to T1 that entails not T1, call it T2. So we have T1 and T2, where T2 entails not T1. If we can show that T2 is ranked ahead of T1, right, and we know that T2 entails not T1, then we've shown that not T1 must be ranked ahead of T1. But, but now notice that we have not just a comparative claim, but an absolute assessment of probability because we can say well we, we say first of all not t1 is ranked ahead of t1 so not t1 is more probable than t1 but that's just to say that not t1 is more likely to be true than not right like t not t1 is pro is more probable um uh, after all in this case there are only two claims to consider and these two claims exhaust all of the options if not t1 is more probable than t1 then not T1 has a probability of over 50%. So, you know, our, com our comparative ranking of T1 and T2 has given us an absolute assessment. Okay, this might seem rather abstract, so let's look at a specific case. Um, 
usually scientists are going to examine theories that are contraries, right? Like as when scientists pitted the uh, Big Bang model against the steady state model. But we can identify a point on which both of these theories disagree, and then we have contradictories. So take the claim, the universe is eternal. That is asserted by the steady state model and denied by the Big Bang model, because the Big Bang model posits that the universe began 13.8 billion years ago. And I guess, you know, like, uh, by universe here, I mean, you know, this, <laughs> like, our, our bit of space. I guess, you know, you might postulate a multiverse or whatever, but, you know, that's an addition to the Big Bang model. Obviously, like, our bit of space, the thing that's expanding that we're in, that began 13.8 billion years ago, according to the Big Bang model. All right, so this is a point where Big Bang and steady state disagree. So we have... Um, the universe is eternal, and it is not the case the universe is eternal. Those are our <coughs> contradictories. And then we have T2, which is the Big Bang model. Okay, we, we, can, we can compare T1 and the Big Bang model. And the Big Bang model comes out ahead of T1, right? And then since Big Bang entails not T1, it must be that not T1 comes out ahead of T1. I mean, it, it must do, because Big Bang model entails it. So... Um, so this is just to say that not T1, the claim the universe is not eternal, that's more likely than not. Uh, that's probably true, right? We can assign a probability of over 50%. Um, so we we have an absolute assessment, right? It's not just a kind of relative ranking of hypotheses. We're not just saying, well, you know, this theory is the best of the lot that we have considered. We have a claim where we can justifiably say it is more likely than not that the universe has a beginning. That it's not eternal. Okay, is this convincing? Uh, so, uh, Karim Khalifa, in, uh, in the article Default Privilege and Bad Lots, uh, raises an objection. Um, so he says that on Lipton's argument, uh, the problem here is that any ranking of theories would become incoherent. So Lipton's idea is that when considering T1, we find a contrary T2 that entails not T1. And if T2 is ranked ahead of T1, then not T1 is ranked ahead of T1, and not T1 is more likely than not to be true. But here's the problem. We could easily find another contrary of T1, call it T3, which entails not T1, but T3 is ranked below T1. So now T1 is ranked ahead of not T1, and by Lipton's argument, T1 is more likely than not to be true. Uh, so, on, on Lipton's view, if there's a contrary of T1 that's ranked above it and a contrary that's ranked below it, we have a straightforward contradiction. T1 is ranked both ahead and behind of not T1. It's both less and more probable than not T1. Um, and, of course, the problem with this is that it's a perfectly common, uh, common feature of, uh, you know, these kinds of assessments that some of a theory's contraries will be ranked above it and some will be ranked below it. Here is again, an example, because this is, again, this is quite abstract. So suppose that biologists are trying to explain the emergence of some tr some trait in a population, say the uh, giant antlers of the now extinct Irish elk. We can come up with three hypotheses for the origin of this trait. So T1 is inheritance of acquired characteristics, Lamarckism. T2 is natural selection. T3 is orthogenesis. Um, Orthogenesis was the view that there are certain traits that are produced by like internal forces that drive the phenotype in a single linear direction. Um, so uh, both Lamarckism and natural selection are mechanisms of adaptation. Whereas according to uh, orthogenesis, um, certain traits may be of no adaptive value whatsoever. Um, and actually some paleontologists in the 1800s did propose that the Irish elk were driven to extinction by an orthogenetic trend producing these unmanageably large antlers. Anyway, it's not really important. The important thing is, you know, we've got these three theories and T2 and T3 both entail not T1, at least with respect to this trait. You know, if we're offering these as explanations of the origin of this particular trait, we can imagine these as exclusive. Um, so, you know, we have <coughs> T2 and T3 denying inheritance of acquired characteristics as an explanation of the giant antlers of the Irish elk. So what do we say in this case? Well, we'd presumably say that T2 is ranked ahead of T1, right? That natural selection is a better explanation than Lamarckism. So we have it that not T1 is more likely to be true than T1. 
But now T1, we might say, is ranked above T3. You know, Lamarckism more plausible than orthogenesis. So in that case, T1 is more likely than not T1. Um, and I mean, you know, this, this isn't a particularly artificial example. In the 1800s, scientists genuinely faced uh, this problem of alternative explanations for the origin of the antlers of the Irish elk. Um, so the worry then is that uh, if Lipton's view is right, we have the incoherent result that T1 is both more probable and less probable than not T1. Well, that's the issue, but, you know, we might sort of ask, okay, so what's what exactly has gone wrong here? Um, perhaps the, the problem is that it doesn't really make sense to evaluate contradictory propositions independently of the theories of which they are a part. Uh, when Lipton tries to collapse comparative evaluation of probability to an absolute assessment of probability, he's divorcing the contradictories from their associated theories. So it makes sense to rank the Big Bang model ahead of the steady state model, or Lamarckism ahead of orthogenesis. But, you know, if you take the Take the propositions, right? The universe is eternal versus the universe is not eternal. Or the Irish elk's antlers were produced by inheritance of acquired characteristics versus the Irish elk's antlers were not produced by inheritance of acquired characteristics. Well, each of these propositions is associated with a whole family of theories. Uh, there are numerous theories that assert the eternality of the universe and numerous theories that deny it. Uh, the only reason why we endorse the claim that the universe has a beginning, that the universe is not eternal, like the reason why we endorse that is due to its connections to other parts of the Big Bang model. We don't evaluate that claim in itself independently of the role it plays in that model. So really the only evaluations we can sensibly make right, are of uh, these like broader models rather than propositions considered independently. So that might be uh, where this uh, problem here comes from, where the, the problem with Lipton's argument here comes from. Um, okay, but uh, so Lipton does have another response to uh, the bad lot problem. Um, so he says, look, the bad lot objection, again, it, it grants that scientists are reliable at ranking theories comparatively. We can identify which theory is the most explanatory, and uh, generally speaking, this theory will be more probable than its competitors. Um, so again, you know, anti-realists grant scientists are reliable rankers. Now, the problem here, Lipton says, is that ranking can only be done with reference to a variety of background theories. Um, why are background theories required? Well, we need background theories to specify, for example, uh, models of the instruments that we use, which uh, guide us in interpreting the data produced by the instrument. When uh, a scientist uses an electron microscope, they have a model of how that instrument functions so as to produce reliable results. So <clears throat> background theories are used to interpret data. Background theories will also direct us in figuring out which data are relevant. Uh, they will help us to determine the prior probability of various hypotheses and so on. Whenever scientists construct a model, there's a great deal that they take for granted. Um, I mean, you know, basically they take for granted most of the science that has been done before them. If I'm creating a model of the evolution of stars, I'm going to work with accepted nuclear physics, right? Like I'm, I'm not, I'm probably not going to challenge um, like fundamental physics when I'm modeling stars. I just assume that as a background. So reliable ranking is possible only if background theories are approximately true. False background theories, Lipton says, I quote, would skew the ranking, leading in some cases to placing an improbable theory ahead of a probable competitor and perhaps leading generally to true theories, when generated, being ranked below falsehoods. Uh, for example, if our theory of the electron microscope is completely mistaken, then its results are irrelevant, or at least um, those results don't say what we think they do. Uh, we, we use data from the electron microscope because of our background theories. A radically different background theory would make us evaluate that data differently, and that would change which theory we think is superior. Imagine if instead we believed that electron microscopes, you know, were like, I don't know, they were like kaleidoscopes that just created images that have nothing to do with anything out there in the world. You know, they're not revealing structures beyond perception. Well, that would obviously alter our evaluation of theories that we have tested using these instruments. So 
If background theories are mostly false, scientists will routinely rank inferior theories over superior ones. But of course, um, this is you know this is denying what the anti-realist is trying to grant in the bad law objection. If we grant that scientists are reliable at ranking competing theories, we must also grant that background theories are approximately true. And of course, that means, well, first of all, that means we get realism, and it means that scientists are epistemically privileged. They tend to generate theories that are approximately true. Uh, Finna Delson in Reactionary Responses to the Bad Lot Objection puts the argument as follows. Premise one, scientists are reliable rankers of theories. Premise two, if scientists are reliable rankers of theories, then their background theories are largely and or approximately true. Premise three, if scientists' background theories are largely and or approximately true, then they generate approximately true theories. They generally generate approximately true theories. So scientists generally generate approximately true theories. And this gives us reason to think that in the first step of IBE, the, the step of generating theories, we often will have the true theory available. It will be included in our lot. So the question here is, does reliable ranking require that background theories are approximately true? Uh, Anti-realists might object that this argument misunderstands what is meant by reliability in this context. Scientists are reliable at ranking theories with respect to explanatory virtues. They are reliable at evaluating evidence, at making comparative judgments about the hypotheses proposed to account for that evidence. If the total evidence that we have available provides more support to theory T than to T2, scientists will tend to select T. So reliability is a matter of ranking the better supported theory over the lesser supported one. It's choosing the theory that is best supported by the evidence. But uh, it need not be a matter of selecting like the more probable theory over the less probable one, um, uh, you know, or, or selecting the one that's like closer to the truth over the one that's furthest from the truth. It may be the case that the theory that is better supported by the evidence would be seen to be less probable if only we had more evidence. Or it may be that the theory that is better supported by the evidence actually contains more false claims, so is further from the truth than its competitor. As, um, as Delson points out, total evidence can be misleading. And this is granted even by realists. Uh, after all, the majority of realists are fallibilists who accept that in principle, scientists, and I guess the rest of us, could be radically mistaken, right? So yeah, in principle, the world could be very unlike the picture provided by contemporary science. Um, and that's just to grant that the total evidence could, in principle, be misleading. But even in that scenario, right, even if the total evidence were completely misleading, scientists could be good judges of which theory the, the evidence best supports. Um, so in other words, the problem in this, in this imagined scenario is that th the problem when one's evidence is misleading is not necessarily that you're bad at ranking theories, it's that your evidence is misleading. Um, Brad Ray, in, in his book Resisting Scientific Realism, expands on this point a bit. So scientists are reliable with respect to their judgments of features of theories that are like open to direct test, like predictive accuracy, uh, simplicity, applicability to technology, testability, and so on. When they judge that uh, T1 better accommodates the data than T2, or that T1 is simpler, simpler than T2, that can be trusted. And the same is true for background theories, right? We have good reason to think that our accepted background theories do a good job of accommodating observations and are simpler. Um, and in fact, you know, they do the best job of the theories available like, as compared to the alternatives that they were competing against. Background theories exhibit the explanatory virtues to a greater degree than the theories to which they were compared. But these theories may be false in terms of their description of the underlying structure and nature of the world, while still supporting reliable judgments about the theoretical virtues of other hypotheses. Um, like you don't need to describe the structure and nature of the world accurately in order to support a reliable judgment about whether some hypothesis accommodates the observations or whether or is you know simpler than some other hypothesis and so on um, I mean you know like the scientists who were working with Newtonian mechanics um, that supported them in making reliable assessments of other hypotheses with respect to explanatory virtues even though Newtonian mechanics was false in you know various claims about like the underlying nature of space-time um, <coughs> so 
uh, the, the anti-realist might say, okay, a scientist can be reliable at judging like the evidential support provided for a theory, even if they're working with radically false background theories. Right, well, uh, that's, that's it. That's the bad lot objection. Um, and uh, that's all I have to say today. I um, hope you found that interesting. Okay, goodbye. <laughs>